Hello, my friend, and welcome back to Catching Your Breath, the podcast. It's episode 41, and I am just so, so glad that you are here. This is the first uh, quote-unquote live recording I've done in a while. I've shared a few sermons and uh, recordings of talks that I've done lately, but this is the first one where I'm sitting down in my little home studio uh, talking directly to you. So, hey, thank you for being here. I have some big, exciting news to share with you if you haven't seen on social media. I am officially a paid author. <laughs> Woo! You hear the crowd going wild? I am officially a paid author. I have uh, finally signed a contract with Broadleaf Press. And I'm working on a new book, and uh, I will tell you um, more about it the closer we get to the release, which will be in the fall of next year. It's fall of 2021. But basically, this book is going to include 99 short, hope-filled entries. So you're going through a hard time. You're having a rough day. Maybe you just need a little pick-me-up. You pick this up, and in just a couple of minutes, uh, you get uh, a hope-filled entry on life at the intersection of faith and mental health. You know, it's kind of my jam. So, super excited about that. Hey, today, I want to talk to you about what you can do if your church isn't safe. So you're in a church and it doesn't feel safe for you, or it doesn't feel safe for your friends, it doesn't feel safe for your family, for a myriad of reasons, uh, maybe life choices, maybe the way they were born, maybe mental illness, maybe chronic illness, maybe race, who knows what that is. But if your church doesn't feel safe, today we're going to talk about what you can do with it. I am going to be sharing a good bit of scripture today, so it's going to feel a little more like a Bible study, uh, but I have just been doing so much study on this concept of being a safe church. So we're going to start in Mark chapter 2, verse 23, through chapter 3, verse 6. And here's what it says in the message. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he, Jesus, said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, the Pharisees, Is it lawful? to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or kill. But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to them, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. You know, just mere religious people, they're always going to have a problem dealing with a mess or a messy person on a Sunday morning. Their hearts are as hard as their stiff suits, and they expect the church to operate more like a country club than a hospital. You show your membership card at the door, you grab a coffee, and don't embarrass yourself. So... Whether we are faced with withered hands or panic attacks on a Sunday morning, the church is tasked. We are charged with the role of being Christ's hands and feet 24-7, 365. It is the role 
of the local church to be a safe place where hurting people can come, lay down their burdens, and rest. If we haven't already run those hurting people off, if we haven't run them away, then people show up at our doors on Sunday morning, sometimes feeling like the psalmist in Psalm 55. Hear my prayer, O God. Do not hide yourself from my petition. Listen to me and answer me. I have no peace because of my cares. I am shaken by the noise of the enemy and the pressure of the wicked. You know, in the midst of deep pain, sorrow, grief, sadness, woundedness, it it can be really tempting to believe that God doesn't hear our prayers. Even though the Bible is really clear that God bottles up every tear with a combination of toxic theology and deep pain, it really makes it easy to convince us that God is long gone, that God and God's compassion has left the building. So we manage to kneel at the altar rail on a Sunday morning hoping that Christ will show up in the bread and the wine. And I think that more often than not, we bring with us this nagging sense that God has left the building. Our anxiety has destroyed our peace. It's shoved it out the back door in the middle of the night. The black dog of depression howls in our ears all night long. And if we're not careful, we buy into the lies that it's because of a lack of faith or it's because of something we have or haven't done for Jesus that God isn't showing up. At the end of that same psalm, Psalm 55, the writer musters up this little slice of wild-eyed hope and says, pile your troubles on God's shoulders. He'll carry your load. He'll help you out. He'll never let good people topple into ruin. Here's what I know. Life, even the Christian life, is unpredictable. It's unfair at best. So don't fool yourself by thinking that the right version of some repeat-after-me salvation prayer is going to grant you immunity from the stress and pains of life. It isn't true. A relationship with God is is not the promise of life on easy street. It's a promise that even when you find yourself in the gutter on Bourbon Street, soaked by your own vomit, abandoned by your own friends, that divine love is already sitting there with you. The rain comes down, the wind howls, you're left all alone, or so you think. But even if I make my bed in hell, it says in Psalm 39, you are there, God. Even if I make my bed in hell, you are there. I believe that our church is in crisis because our people are in crisis. I went to a workshop, a weekend workshop in Tennessee a couple of months ago, and my friend Paul Young introduced our group to this Greek word, crisis, K-R-I-S-I-S, crisis. And in the New Testament, that word crisis is often translated as judgment, but crisis is actually more accurately defined as the word separation. Well, who cares, right? I know this is not a lesson in Greek, but in this instance, I think it really matters. I want, I hope that this episode will serve as a reminder to you and a reminder to those you care about and a reminder to your pastor, if you find the courage to share this with them, a reminder that Christ meets us in our crisis. In the very midst of separation, whether that's physical separation like grieving a loss or perceived separation like how could God possibly love me after what I've done, people are desperate, desperate to be introduced to El Roy, 
the God who sees me, that God that met Hagar in the desert of her desperation, and she named God Elroy. Surely you are the God who sees me. So whether we're talking about Hagar or the psalmist or Jesus on the cross, each of us is subject to think some unthinkably painful things. We're subject to these terrible seasons that cause us to ask, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think this is why Ann Ahrens says that in his prayer from the cross, quote, Jesus shows all people who would come after him how to suffer righteously by joining together with those who trusted Yahweh before him and praying in their words. And she goes on to say, the cross paradoxically teaches believers that strength is found in weakness. And that resurrection cannot take place without death and the accompanying tears and suffering. She says Christ's suffering showed believers that he was able to sympathize with our weakness, Hebrews 4.15. Taking appropriate time to linger in the lament in corporate worship without pressure of an immediate rush to rejoicing reminds believers that Christ understood human frailty and that worshipers can safely bring suffering to the cross within the community of believers, end quote. So here's what I think about good news. The good news is that even in those seasons when it feels like our bed resides in hell, God is with us. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? But it's not always easy to remember that hope when our souls have been crushed by the weight of this wounded, fearful, shame-filled, guilt-driven world. It's not always easy to remember that hope. In the grip of suffering, sometimes people sitting in our pews and even people standing behind our pulpit every week need that reminder that God is a very present help in time of need. So maybe maybe you're listening to this episode and you're wondering what type of pastor is needed to serve a community that is safe and inclusive for everyone. What would that look like? Well, here's some good news. The Bible makes it very clear. 1 Corinthians describes what a Christian leader should be. Here's what the message says. We are guides into God's most sublime secrets, not security guards posted to protect them. The requirements for a good guide are reliability and accurate knowledge. The NIV says that very same thing like this. Those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. 1 Corinthians 1 9 says, God has put us who bear his message on stage in a theater in which no one wants to buy a ticket. We're something everyone stands around and stares at, like an accident in the street. We're the Messiah's misfits. We live in the midst of frailties and uncertainties. Well, that doesn't sound like really any pastor I grew up under. We're the Messiah's misfits. We live in the midst of our own frailty and uncertainty. <sighs> what an image. And then I so appreciate this question that Paul poses at the end. How do you want a Christian leader to show up? Quote, as a severe disciplinarian who makes you toe the mark or as a good friend and counselor who wants to share heart to heart with you, you decide. I think this is such a great perspective on Christian leadership. We are guides 
We're not experts. We're friends. We're not disciplinarians. And I think that maybe that's why I love Holy Communion so much, because it's this clear reminder that we all show up as Messiah's misfits. We're hungry, thirsty. Each one of us are in need of Christ's healing presence. In the book, The Places That Scare You, the author says, quote, In cultivating compassion, we draw from the wholeness of our experience, our suffering, our empathy, as well as our cruelty and terror. It has to be this way. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It is a relationship between equals. And don't miss this. Only when we know our own darkness can we be present with the darkness of others. Compassion becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity. Or what about this quote from St. John Chrysostom? If you cannot find Christ in the beggar at the door, you will not find him in the chalice. So take a look at the leadership in your own church. Are they humble? Are they approachable? Do they seem like someone you could share your own story with heart to heart? Or do they seem more like security guards protecting this great mystery of God? It is heartbreaking to hear the stories of people who have been pushed away because church people viewed them as just too messy. And I don't know if it happens because Christians can become so religious that they leave behind the gospel message of the love of God and neighbor in the dust and they truly forget what it's like to struggle. Or if it's because they just don't want to deal with the drama. But either way, it makes for a very unwelcoming community. In doing some research for one of these upcoming books, I shared a survey online and got countless responses all about church safety. And I want to share just a few of them with you right now. The first one is from Angie. Angie opened up about her own struggle with theology and mental health. And here's what she says. There are a couple of things over the years that make me feel unsafe with church. The first was when I was in college. I started having issues with anxiety and depression and started seeing a therapist to address past trauma. My emotions were so raw and I was having panic attacks on a regular basis. I was involved in the youth ministry at my church. And at a leadership meeting, I was called up so the others could lay hands on me and pray for me. The person leading this started pushing me and telling me, you need to tell the devil to quit pushing you around. Tell him. He just kept on and on until I finally had to get out of there and I locked myself in the bathroom until I could pull myself together. Not long after that, I told the youth pastors that I didn't feel like I was in a good place to be leading a small group at youth camp we were doing. They were upset with me, told me I was too familiar and being defiant and running from God. Another incident that occurred during the same time frame was when I had a panic attack and someone decided they needed to cast the demon out of me. I was told if I had faith that I would just stand on the word and things would get better. The only person who did see me was my pastor's wife. She never said any of those things to me and actually helped me find a therapist. Angie told me that she hasn't been to church in many years, and her advice to churches today is recognize that depression and anxiety are not a lack of faith. The Bible is full of people dealing with mental health issues. Meet people where they are and walk alongside them instead of belittling them. 
Another lady who responded to this online survey asked to remain anonymous, but she did tell me that she was 50 years old and a former church leader in the Assemblies of God denomination. And her story, reading through it, reminds me so much of Job's. Here's what she said. At one point, I was literally having a mental breakdown. It was really serious. My daughter called the pastor's wife because she was afraid for me. I just couldn't stop crying. The pastor's wife came over and convinced me to come to her house and stay for a few days and rest. I was really thankful because it was exactly what I needed. A safe place to feel loved and taken care of. Well, we're off to a great start, right? The pastor's wife is embracing this person's woundedness with compassion. She's opening up her home for a few days. She's giving the gift of rest, of love, of belonging. But what happens next is heartbreaking. And at the same time, it really doesn't shock me. Here's what she says. She had me pack a bag. I asked her if I could bring some of my energy drinks, monsters, over for the morning. She said, of course I could. When I got there, I put the drinks in the fridge. When the pastor got home, he saw the drinks and flipped out because he thought they were demonic. I started to get afraid and wanted to leave, so I got out my bag and started walking to the door, which made him even angrier. I was so afraid that I turned around and went back in the room and had a massive panic attack, which lasted for probably an hour, one of the longest ones I've ever had. I stayed the night, honestly, because I feared I had to. The last thing I needed was someone angry with me. And when I asked this respondent how this whole situation made her feel, she said, it made me feel like I had no hope. It made me feel worthless. It made me feel afraid. It added to my already overwhelming issues. I wish people knew how much bravery it takes to share my taboo issues. And that should be applauded and even displayed. But instead, I get swept under a rug and hidden because they don't know what to do with me. If church leadership wants to Learn how to make their faith community a safe place to heal. Here's her advice. Stop trying to act like you know what to do. Ask how you can be of help to me. Love me with your words and attention and use me in ministry. The very things you're keeping me from, like leading worship, are the very things that help me overcome my struggle. You are cutting off my legs and crippling me by calling me unfit And taking me out of ministry. One other powerful story came from Jill, who's a rape survivor. When I asked Jill about her experience with the church in the face of this terrible and dark trauma, she said, I wasn't believed. I felt like I was wearing a scarlet letter. And what does she wish had happened? Jill says, love as an approach, would have been so much better. I wish they'd approached me with understanding and belief. And when I asked her if she could give one piece of advice to church leadership uh, who desire to make their communities safe sanctuaries, Jill said her advice would be, don't assume, listen. Listen twice. And ask if a rape victim wants to talk to a man or a woman. So let me ask you something. If your faith community isn't a safe place to fully show up, wounds on display, what keeps you going back? I often think of it as this abusive marriage. The abused spouse continues to return to their abuser because they haven't known anything else. They think the abuse is normal. They can't possibly imagine freedom Because fear and this sense of worthlessness are their constant companions. It's the same way with toxic churches and fear-based theology. We keep going back, hoping that we won't screw up again. And that somehow we'll learn a new trick to garner the approval of church leadership, which we somehow internalize as the love and acceptance 
of God. So many of the sages of our faith communities come from the same basic demographic. They're white, they're straight, and they're male. And there's nothing wrong with being those things, but what about the vast majority of people who don't fit that description? When we tell the women to go home, or we refuse to listen to people of color, the disabled, the young, our brothers and sisters who are LGBTQ+, why wouldn't they also infer that God doesn't care about them either? If the very communities who boldly proclaim the name of Jesus actually just mean us four and no more, why wouldn't people begin to believe that if their story doesn't matter to the church, their life also doesn't matter to God? The world today is incredibly diverse. But you wouldn't know it by this Stepford Wives version of Christianity that we often display on Sunday mornings across America. And as a result, many eventually decide to go ahead and end what everyone else seems to think of as a worthless existence. This is exactly why I firmly believe that the Church of Jesus Christ is culpable in the epidemic of despair that we're seeing today. Anne Ahrens explains it this way. Attitudes within some sectors of evangelicalism toward biblical counseling as a profession and an essential ministry of the church have often been resistant or skeptical in past decades. The crying needs inside and outside the church in present day demand that all ministries of the church partner together to serve the common good of the suffering Such joint ministry is not an option, but a necessity in current culture. Each time that we Christians refuse entry into these Sunday morning country clubs we've created, we push people further into things like alcoholism, drug addiction, and suicide. And I see Jesus weeping over this modern-day Jerusalem, calling us broods of vipers and whitewashed tombs. We were called to be light bearers, but we've become nothing but agents of fear. So why do you keep going back to an abusive relationship? Is it time to look for a new church? Or is it time to speak up right where you are and demand that things change? I know I can't answer that for you, but my prayer for you is that if your church isn't a safe place for everyone, that you will find the courage to either leave or do something to change it. God is not your abuser, and the church shouldn't be either. If you ever want to talk through some of this, if you ever want to look at what wholeness looks like, if you ever want to talk about your self-worth, if you want to stop living in fear and discover a God who is safe, affirming, patient, present, I'd love to talk to you. If you go to catchingyourbreath.com and scroll down, you will see Embracing Wholeness Coaching. And I'd love to work with you. The other thing that you can do uh, is look at my church consulting. If you're um, a pastor, if you're in church leadership, and you want your church to become a safe place, a safe place for everyone, an inclusive place for everyone, if you'd like for me to evaluate and effectively approach the psychological safety of your congregation, I'd love to help you. I help through active listening, through designing a clear vision, through empowering your ministry team, through strategic action. So if you're wondering if your church is safe, go to catchingyourbreath.com under the work with me tab. If you'll highlight over that, a drop down menu will show up that says church consulting. If you click on that link, there's a quiz right there to find out just how safe your church is. I will tell you again, God is not your abuser, and the church shouldn't be either. 
Thanks for listening.